Can you all hear all right? Great. Well, I just have to say I'm so excited to be here, both in Prague, where it's just been beautiful and incredible to be in the city, but also just what I've heard so far in this conference, and I'm thrilled to be here and to be able to contribute to this event. So for those of you familiar with Paul Simon, you might recognize that I borrowed the title of my talk from one of his famous songs. And the reason I chose to do so is because there is, I hope to show you, a very valuable resource that you have all around you that we tend to just step over. And that resource is dissatisfaction. And really I see this as, as a version of, of alchemy, where we're turning something that's really undervalued into something golden, uh, really a resource to be, to be treasured. I've been trained as a geographer, and as a geographer, I look at layers and interconnections and how people and place and time all intersect. And as a consultant, what I see is a disconnect between what workers see and what executives are able to recognize and to hear. So through this talk, I hope to enable you to see and hear in new ways and open your eyes to this resource of dissatisfaction all around you. Now, dissatisfaction really is easiest to recognize as complaining, but it does have a variety of forms. So I'm curious how many of you have colleagues who seem to spend a lot of time complaining. <laughs> yeah. And what about managers or leaders that don't seem to have the time or the interest to really hear what you might have to say? Maybe not as much? Great. Um, well, what I am talking about with dissatisfaction is something that's really on every level of an organization. And it's oftentimes unrecognized or dismissed, sort of something to kind of tuck away. Um, but. I want to entice you to see it as something to seek out and understand, and I want to help you on your path to doing that. The new questions that I hope you'll take away from this talk are asking yourself, how often do you avoid dissatisfaction or dread it? How often do you elicit it or seek it out? So I imagine that you're here because you're someone with a vision of a future, a future that you want to help create. And I'm going to take a moment to just tell you a bit about a part of what I did for the first decade of my career, and that was helping women have babies. And birth really is an ultimate agile moment. It's, um, it's something where you start with an initial vision, and you go through a process and hope to come out at the end with an outcome that you feel satisfied about, not just in terms of health and safety, but also looking at saying, did I move through this in a way that felt authentic and good and right for me? And so this is a point where you really use dissatisfaction. And in supporting women in labor, for me, finding out what's not working is really helpful information as I think about what else to try next. And so if you think about, or maybe some of you have been with a woman or yourself in labor for, say, 30 hours, and if you imagine that 30 hours of labor with someone who is having trouble saying that they don't like something, maybe because they feel shy or scared or because I'm supposed to birth like that and that's not how I'm feeling, right? This is, this is a huge obstacle to actually being agile in that moment and to ending up in an outcome that feels really satisfying. So what I hear a lot as I work with people in dissatisfaction is, oh, do I really have to listen to that? And maybe some of you have found yourself feeling that or hearing that around you. And the, the point here is that without dissatisfaction, there's no room for improvement. There's no way to grow, to become more profitable, to respond to market changes, um, to any of that. And when, well, I want to look at a couple companies that give uh, some insight into this. One of them is Retrium, which is a great organization that runs agile retrospectives. Their hugest barrier turns out to be executives saying, why do I need to pay for that? I already know what they're going to say. 
And an example from the United States is Costco, which is a big box retailer that's a membership-based retailer, and they are rated highest in terms of both employee satisfaction and customer satisfaction. And when you put those two together, you say, well, there must be something happening layer upon layer in that organization that's, that's creating these positive outcomes for both customers and employees. So, a lot of us complain. There's some numbers about up here about how much we complain. And that translates with this dissatisfaction not being dealt with into some substantial numbers, both in terms of time and money and what this, this costs. And when we look at Agile, I think that Agile does a wonderful job being able to take in dissatisfactions about a product. And the agility challenge is to do the same thing with dissatisfactions within the organization to be able to see the customer within, within the organization. And this really is the, the big stumbling block in getting Agile out of IT and into an organization-wide adoption. One company that did this really well is Johnsonville. Now I know that we're in the Czech Republic where there's great sausages. Johnsonville happens to be a sausage company more from uh, where I am from, which is the Midwest of the United States. And when they started down there, what we can now say is, a, is an agility journey, but this was in the early 80s, they actually looked great on paper. They had a growth of over 20%, but the CEO recognized that he was still dissatisfied. And he wasn't dissatisfied with the numbers, he was dissatisfied with what he was seeing and feeling within his employees. And what he saw is that they just didn't seem to care. He saw a gap between what, was, uh, what he thought was possible and what was actually happening. So he started to, he took that as a, as a reflection on him to say, well, I created this culture where people aren't taking responsibility, where they're so disengaged that someone literally drove a forklift into a wall and then tried to pass it off as not really their fault. Um, so what he did was started to give the questions and the control back to his employees. And so when they came to him to say, we're really frustrated by how much overtime we have, he said, well, what do you need to address that problem? And what they realized when they had a collection of workers all together, they looked at it and said, well, our machine downtime is about 30 to 40%. So if we can make these operational changes and get these machines working more efficiently, they actually got that down to lower than 10% and no longer had to work weekends. And so they, they ended up seeing a lot of these results, and in, including profitability and team functionality so high that they were able to acquire another company and grow, and they're still a very vital, robust organization today. So I'm gonna go quickly over this stuff because I think you already know that one of the things that inhibits us is this uh, legacy we've got through the industrial age where we see people as machines, as human resources. The robotics era got us to think about maybe we don't even need people at all, we could just put a machine in place. The commercial age made us see, see consumers as very um, predictable beings. You show, them this, you show them a picture of pizza, they're gonna wanna buy pizza. Um, and we've done a bunch of studies to prove this, and this is, you know, looking at ways that we can maximize our human resource. How can we adjust the lighting, the temperature, the ergonomics, so that we get maximum output from our worker bees? Agile, right, brings a more responsive view. We've had a responsive view of the customer since about the 1950s, where we started to ask, what if, the customer is right. Now, the customer is not always right, but what if we took that inquiry? And then from there, what if we take the inquiry about if the employee might be right? But this is hard, and this touches on something Marsha just spoke about in her talk, which is that feedback is a really high stakes game. And this comes from our neurobiology, which says that belonging is essential to our survival. And if we risk being cut off from a group, then it is most likely when we are ancestors on the savannah that we were gonna face death. So this is not a, um, this is not something to be taken lightly. Social neuroscience also tells us that our brains shut down when we're under threat. 
And this is a key point. We want to flee. And what this means in the context of feedback conversations is we want to get rid of it by saying, by explaining it away. So they don't know what they're talking about. Ugh, that fear, that just get me out of here response. And what we know through brain scans is that feedback conversations, whether you're the one giving it or the one receiving it, is highly stressful. In fact, it has stress hormones akin to what I'm doing right now, which is speaking in front of a large group. So keep that in mind next time you have one of these conversations that this is a highly stressful situation. And what I want to do is start to give you some tools to take down that stress so that you can actually benefit from this golden resource. But first, we also need to mention that we have some socialization that hinders feedback too. We are trained in a lot of ways that giving feedback is mean and that asking for it means we're dumb. And those things happen a lot through schooling and a lot through other ways of socialization. So I have a very simple proposal, which is divorce. I want to separate the ideas of dissatisfaction and dislike, not Liking the way a report came on your desk does not mean disliking the report maker or that that person is always and forever going to be terrible at making those reports, right? But there's a dissatisfaction to be listened to if you're going to get a, re a report that's meaningful and useful to you in this example. So when we make that divorce, we allow dissatisfaction not to be a mood, but to be an assessment. And it, when it becomes an assessment, it allows you to get where you want to go. And that happens through practice, and that happens through habit. And so that's why this needs to become a sustained, ongoing process in your lives and in your organizations. Ooh. This one, there we go. A company that did this really effectively was actually Microsoft. And in 2011, Microsoft's company culture was famously illustrated in this cartoon by Manny Cornette of departments pointing guns at each other. Right? I see some nodding from people who are well aware that this was a very uh, high stakes environment where the, the way of operating there was, I need to go to a meeting already knowing the answers. I need to be prepared to look smart and shoot down anyone else that might have a lesser idea. So when this man, Satya Nadella, was chosen as their CEO, jaws dropped. And he took a very different approach. And he asked the question, what would it take for us to become a culture of learn-it-alls instead of know-it-alls? And if you're going to be a learn-it-all, you have to be able to ask questions and get feedback, which means you have to deal with dissatisfaction. And by doing this, he has revolutionized Microsoft. It was starting to have its stock price failing. People were saying, I wouldn't even want the job of being a Microsoft CEO. And now, $250 million in profit. That is unheard of. Almost unheard of, unless you're Mark Zuckerberg or of the like, right? So feedback is how we stay alive. This is biological. This is true if you're an amoeba. This is true if you're a fox looking to know, did that hunting ground provide me enough prey that I could provide for my family? If you're a salesperson saying, did that technique help me meet my goals? If you're a department saying, am I hitting my metrics? But sharing it can be really risky. So your job, my job, all of our work here is to contribute to and create a culture where asking feedback is rewarded and safe and expected. So this is where we get into a masterful move with feedback. What research is showing is that more than, than giving feedback, the powerful move is asking for it. Take a minute to think of the last time you have asked someone for feedback. A lot of times we don't do it because it's uncomfortable. We think, in my practice, there was a time where I didn't ask for feedback because I felt like I just knew. And if I knew it went well, why did I need to, I knew the client was happy, why did I need to get that feedback? 
And if I wasn't really sure how they felt, I didn't really want to have that uncomfortable conversation. But when I started asking, I started to learn things about what my clients valued that I hadn't been aware of. And it helped me hone more and more in on what was actually effective. And to borrow terms from what you just heard with Marsha, right, to find that sweet spot. So the key here that I want to say is, that to, is to start small, right? So we might think about, hey, can you give me feedback on that project I was working on for the last sprint or for the last half year? But what I want to challenge you to do is start in smaller ways. Be like, hey, how's that new desk set up working for you? And you start to have those small questions and they build up over time and you create a culture where this is comfortable. Another thing we learn from neurobiology is that asking for help is highly motivating. And two companies that did this really successfully in recent times, one is Arby's, which is a fast food chain in the United States. And their CEO came in at a time when the company was facing $350 million, $350 million annual losses. And so in his first six, six months of tenure, he went around and asked over a thousand employees one simple question. What would you do if you were me? And three years later, $3.7 billion in sales, 20% growth in three years. Who wouldn't love to have that kind of growth? It's pretty impressive. And Xerox, a really similar thing um, here with Anne O'Kahey, who came in and um, started asking people what they didn't like about the company. And she came in and, and made a, a substantial transformation in, um, in a company that was on the verge of bankruptcy. And came in, asked these simple questions, and found a turnaround in the time, this happened, by the way, during the, the recession of the late aughts. So these are quite powerful questions. So what this comes down to as a, as a leadership move is to reinforce when you get that feedback. And here's another small divorce that I propose, is to make sure you distinguish thank you for sharing with I agree with you. Those are not the same thing. And this is important because a lot of times we'll have a, I see as leaders start to get comf try on this idea, they'll say, okay, well I want feedback from you, but as long as it doesn't sound like you're complaining. But the thing is, when you ask for feedback, you can't control when and how it comes, and you need to look for the diamonds underneath there. So this Tim Cook quote, which you can read, I find profound because he gave a sales associate such a profound experience of being listened to that that sales associate went home and wrote a blog post about it. And you can imagine if it's so impactful that he wrote a blog post about it, when he came to work the next day, he was going to employ his curiosity, speak up, ask questions, give feedback even more readily. In a pair that I worked with, I was, um, I was working with a the two people that were running a department that were chronically at odds, they were um, underperforming, they were blaming each other at every corner. I can't do this because they didn't do that. It's not my fault because I'm blocked over here. And yet there was no way around this in the department. The two of them had to coordinate for, for operations to function smoothly. But they couldn't even talk to each other. They really couldn't. Every interaction was painful, whether it was on the phone, over email, in person. So I offered them one simple challenge that they accepted. I asked them each time one of them came to the other, the first response was going to be, I'm so glad you asked. I said, you can follow that up with a laugh, you can roll your eyes and say, Gracie said I had to say that, but the point is I want you to say that. And within a few days, an email landed in my inbox titled, awesome! And it went on to detail an interaction, and she says, you know, I could tell she was in a bad mood, but we had a great exchange, and it's, it's, a huge, it's a sign of success. And so if you think about that happening within a week on a pair that's chronically at odds, think about what that kind of practice could do in your organization over time. So another piece here is the response. And I want to emphasize that when you get feedback, a response is needed. 
And this seems obvious if you're face to face, but what some people find works in their organization or they want to try having work is surveys or suggestion boxes. And those can be fine, but there's a danger zone there. The danger zone is that when you don't respond, you inadvertently send the message of, I don't, I don't care. Your feedback isn't actually that useful. And that's, that's a hit because we want to contribute. And when we spend the time and energy saying, hey, here's something I think might be of value to you, and there's no response, it doesn't incentivize to, us to do it again. And so one of the, this might seem obvious, but there's an essential resource that this asks of, and that's time. A lot of people tell me I don't have time for feedback. And the, my short response is that, to that is, you don't have time to not have feedback. Because then you're going to do the work over again. And it might come around and be an even bigger problem than it was the first time. So I've already challenged you to start feedback by asking for it for yourself. And hopefully modeling this behavior is going to help other people do the same thing. But there are going to be times when you will want to or need to give feedback to someone who hasn't asked for it. And there's a key masterful move that you can utilize here, and that's to ask for consent, to ask for permission before offering that feedback. That allows the other person engaged in this exchange to set some context for them that might make it a little bit easier. It might say, I would love to hear that, but can we do it tomorrow? I'm slammed today. Or, that would be great, but you know who else I think should be in this conversation? is Jane and John. Let's find a time for all of us to meet. So this is a, a good contribute to, again, reduce that stress. And the underpinning here of what, what this comes down to is curiosity. And curiosity, to me, is closely linked with respect. When curiosity is genuine, it comes from a respectful place and it conveys respect. And this is a fundamental human need that we have. Right? And so, to look at what happens when we move away from this respectful curiosity, right? that complaining is what, how we start to move with our dissatisfaction. And that happens for good reason. Dissatisfaction, when we experience it, is uncomfortable. We think of it maybe mentally uncomfortable, maybe we might be trying to work through a problem, but physically, it's uncomfortable somewhere in our bodies. Some of us might feel it in our chest feeling tight, some of it might feel in the pit of our stomach, some of us our pinky toe might wiggle. But you, the point is here is that you do feel it. And when you're experiencing that discomfort, complaining provides this temporary release, right? We call it venting, letting off steam. But what it does is it channels that energy in a sideways direction that doesn't actually allow you to, to make a useful action with, with what you know. And when that gets repeated and pent up over time, what starts to happen is something I call the should spiral. Right? So when we're dissatisfied in our workplaces and we don't use curiosity, when we assume our brains do this natural thing, they make stories and we fill in the gaps with something that, that seems to make sense to us. So we start to say things like, well, they should know this, they clearly don't care. Or, I've already told them, they should have it done by now, they're just lazy, right? We start to make meaning, and when that gets repeated and repeated, what we end up in is the should spiral, which causes resentment and resignation. And resentment and resignation, to me, are the primary drivers of business stagnation, um, business is failing. I think that if I could send a survey to the Fortune 500 companies and get a read on resentment and resignation, I could play the stock market like nobody's business. I could tell you who is going to start, continue to thrive and who is on their way to failure. So what do you do with dissatisfaction? I say that the way out is through. And I will also admit, that is a phrase I have said to a lot of women in labor. When you are experiencing that discomfort, the way, the way through is to move towards it and decide what you want to do with it. 
So the first step is to recognize that you're dissatisfied. Some of us are, are so uh, accustomed to ignoring it, pushing it aside, that even recognizing you're experiencing dissatisfaction is significant. And then you take a phrase that I've borrowed from Marsha, which is a golden pause. And a golden pause is about accessing the information you have. If you're dissatisfied, you have information. You need to do something with it. You want to get to an action. And you might, by the time you've paused and noticed your dissatisfaction, you might know now, ah, this is what I need to do. But if you don't, then there's a step in the middle, which is to ask for help. Right? That might be asking a colleague, a friend, the internet, but to stop and figure out what it is you need to do because it's really too costly to ignore. So, I want to leave you with this, which is the foundation of curiosity mines you the gems that come from dissatisfaction. And as you move along in your journey of this, there's a few pillars to keep in mind. The first is that divorce of dissatisfaction and dislike. They are not the same thing. And then practicing this until it's a habit, starting small, building from there. And you want to model it first. Hey, I'm trying a new, a new format for our reviews. Could you let me know how this compares to what we did before? Right? Start asking for feedback on your own thing and, and then let others follow. When they do, reinforce and reward that dissatisfaction being voiced, that feedback coming your way, even if you don't agree. But once you, once you allow for it to be there, your the quality builds over time. Right? You're going to get better and better feedback the more people feel that it is actually welcome and responded to. And then when you need to offer someone else some feedback, ask for their permission before just launching in. Let them be part of setting the context for that. All right. So I want to thank you so much for your time and attention today. I want to acknowledge that, as someone said this morning, we stand on the shoulders of giants, and many have come before. And I hope you all have fun on your journey of mining the gems from dissatisfaction. Don't be afraid to ask for support, and enjoy. So thank you so much. All right, thank you, Jason Kester. You have also.